Well, good morning, good morning, good morning. I realize uh, today is uh, obviously tomorrow's September 11th, and we'll be remembering again. I don't know, it just seems kind of crazy. It's been 22 years. Yeah, but we remember. For some of you, you probably didn't even think about that, but you did realize today is the first weekend of the NFL football season. <laughs> That's how unfortunate we are in all this, right? Uh, so I realize that too, so we'll see how fast I can get through this. But nowadays, you're probably watching it on your phone anyway, so you don't have to hurry to get out of here, right? So that's, that's the unfortunate part in some of this. I guess it's fortunate for me because maybe you'll stay longer. But I hope you listen. We're continuing our series in Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 11. That's probably one of the most referred to. I mean, there's a lot of in it, but Hebrews 11 is referred to so often because it's called what? The faith chapter. And I don't know that I'm the best person to preach on the faith chapter. So I started having to reflect, kind of looking back over where I've been in my journey with Christ and where I am now and what I'm looking forward to because faith is more than just really just about uh, a good theology And a good belief system, it's way bigger than that. So we're going to talk about that. But I'm going to start reading in Hebrews. I'm going to read Hebrews 11. I'm not reading all of it because there's a lot there. But if you've never read it, I I hope you would take some time. And and some call it the Hall of Fame of Faith. Like I said, the chapter of faith. And there's some people listed there that you would might surprise you if you didn't know Scripture real well. And you would look at it. Or if you do know Scripture real well, you might surprise you. Okay. But most of them you will probably know, and so that's what we're going to do right now, and then we will kind of start breaking it down, and how does it apply to us today? Hopefully, I can help us with that. Now, faith is confidence in what we hope for, and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command, so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. By faith, Abel brought God a better offering than Cain. Cain did. By faith, he was commended as righteous when God spoke well of his offering. And by faith, Abel still speaks, even though he's dead. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. And without faith, and without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone comes to him must believe that he exists, then he rewards those who earnestly, earnestly circle it, highlight, whatever you got to earnestly seeks him. Not casually, not by happenstance, but earnestly seeks him. By faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear. You ever done anything out of holy fear? Out of holy fear, he built an ark to save his family. By his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that is in keeping it with faith. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place where he would later, to a place he would later receive as an inheritance, obeyed and went even though, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he's made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. And by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful who had made the promise. And so from this one man... And he, as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. All these people, all these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting there were foreigners and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. They had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had an opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city 
for them. By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He would embrace the promises we're about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though Sarah, even though God said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God, Abraham reasoned that God could raise the dead. Not just Isaac, but he could raise the dead. And so in manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. Verse 39, these are all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised since God had planned something better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect. Like that God had planned something better for us so that only together with us. He's perfect already. But he's saying with us makes it better. I appreciate what you said, Brandon. And it reminds me of the saying we say over and over here from Leif Peterson, God loves you. He's coming after you. He's on your side. He's relentless, right? And by faith, I believe that God is chasing after us running after us. Faith is living in light of the reality of God. And the assurance that he fulfills his promise. And without this kind of faith, It's the only kind of faith that pleases God. As I've said before, the day I came to know Christ, December 14th, 1986, was not the day all this became true. It was true, and I believed. Because it's always been, by faith, I believe it's always been true. It's just that day I opened up to it, and it transformed my life. Living by faith is part of our mission statement here at Renovation. Living by, live by faith, known by love, be a voice of hope. Live by faith. Comes out of 1 Thessalonians 1, 3. We remember before our God and Father, your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Faith. Love, hope. But to live by faith is more than a theology. Often we like to say, I'm a person of faith. But sometimes we, we, I think we, we miss the point. Because we often say that in the fact that I have a set of beliefs that I adhere to, I may not always apply them, but I have a set of beliefs that I have hook my wagon to, I'm with that crew, I'm with that tribe, I'm with that group of people. I, I, when I think about it and I look at it and I think through it, that makes sense to me so I have stuck with them. But the reality is the faith I have in Jesus Christ is more than an intellectual agreement. It is I believe that Christ not only is who he says he was, and yes, I believe that in my mind, but also I believe it in a way that he not only saved me from my past, he saved saved me for some kind of future, but he gave me power for the present. So I believe in that. I stand on that. I live by that. I get up every day hoping that. But I also believe that a theology just of, a a, a faith just based on theology is not always very transformative. I want a transformative faith where the faith is not only does a God that maybe stop me from doing bad things. You know, we may make a list of things. I'm sure before, I I know for me, before I came to to be a Christian, I had such a foul mouth. I, I really did. And I'd get creative with it. I was pretty good at it. 
but I hated it. Jan hated it worse. And I wanted to stop. And I tried. But the Lord did deliver me from it. He didn't deliver me from always having it in my mind, though. There are times I just think, boy, that cuss word would work right there. Boy, that, that, that would fit right there. Not, now, I'm not saying I did it. I'm just saying sometimes you go, well, that, that, that would work. But I want to say this. God not only stopped me from using language that was detrimental to not only myself, but to people around me. He also made me an encourager. So he didn't just stop me from doing something. He began to make me into something that I wasn't before. See, I don't want to be a a guy who just stops gossiping and slandering and cursing. I want to become an encourager. I want to give life to people. I don't want to just do this where I'm I'm no longer taking life from people by doing all these slandering and gossiping. Yeah, that's cool. I'm no longer taking life from them and from myself. I want to speak life. That's the transformative faith. I want that kind of faith. And I may not, like I've told you before, when I came to know Christ, didn't know the first book of the Bible. I think I said that again a few weeks ago. But here's the deal. What I did start knowing and what I did start realizing, I started trying to, to apply. So it was more than just a theology that I now agreed with. I now began to apply it and to begin to transform And the more I applied it and the more I allowed God to take over my life, some things just had to leave. They had no room for them anymore. They had to go. By faith, I tried to walk into that. I believe, because there's evidence in this room, by faith, I believe I serve a God who can mend a broken heart and one that has failed I believe God can bring people's lives out of the ashes and resurrect them to make them something they never imagined they could be or anybody else you could ever imagine. Just having the right theology doesn't work. You need good beliefs. You need solid and stand on them because then Especially when you know the word, when the enemy comes, you're able to turn it right back around on him. But that alone doesn't transform people's lives. Matter of fact, it gives you a bad excuse to keep acting bad. (laughs) So living by faith. First off, let's establish this. Living by faith, we all do it. Okay, because one of the things that in our culture, people go, oh, you're a man of faith. Uh, That means you believe in this hocus-pocus Christian thing, this thing you can't see. But the reality is this, and I've read this years ago, and it just stuck with me. It stuck with me. Even the most skilled and hardened evolutionist or atheist have faith. Everybody's following somebody and the experience that's influenced them. And what often happens, and I know this and you know this, they are more skilled often at what they know, so they try to back us into a corner because there are some things we just can't visually prove, and of course they can't either. Colton and I went on a hike. Uh, We were in Moab a few years ago, and we were canyoneering and hiking in and then rappelling all the way back out, and it was awesome, it was fun. And If you've ever been to Moab, it's a beautiful place. But this guy was telling us all about the rock formations. And I, I remember he's going to, I think it's between, that rock formation between three and five billion years ago. Or whatever he said, I'm going, well, that's a big gap. Let's get a little more narrow here on what that is. And the reality is he's speaking this by faith. I don't know the answer to all that. I don't know how many years it was and doesn't really even matter to me. Because whether you believe in a creator and that there is great intention, 
that what's happening here on earth is headed somewhere? This is headed somewhere. I believe with all my heart, we're headed somewhere. And I'm not talking about, oh, there's an, I'm not talking about forecasting the economy or, you know, I'm talking about we're headed somewhere. What we do here matters. Or whether you believe that when this is all said and done, it's over. It's just over. You go to the dirt, you go in the dirt, you become dirt, basically. It all takes a tremendous amount of faith. And I think that is the one thing that that, that gets so tricky when we talk about this kind of stuff is that, that, that somehow or another, people like us that are in this room today, many of you, that you somehow or another are people of faith and everybody else is not. Because I believe if you're a creationist or evolutionist, liberal or conservative, Democrat or Republican, fortunately we agree on enough things in this world we can all exist together the laws and things of that nature that we all agree on that's good enough that we can all make it together. Thank goodness, I think we agree on a whole lot more than we differ on. That's just my opinion. Way more, but the differs are more harped on because that's better for somebody. Not sure who. But all the perspectives are faith perspectives. I love what he made sure of here in the, right out of the shoot, the writer of Hebrews in verse three. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command. So that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. It didn't exist before. However it happened, it didn't exist before. And now it does. Now our minds can't comprehend that, right? Our minds can't imagine Our minds can't go to a place where it didn't exist and now it does exist. We can create things. A lot of you have created some cool looking things and done some cool things, but not out of nothing. I think it's very important. And I think the writer of Hebrews states it. Because a few verses later, without this kind of faith, you will not please God. Without this kind of faith, You're not found in good standing with God, if you will. But one thing I am convinced of, we're all people of faith. The second thing is this. Living by faith, faith, don't become too attached. All these people were still living by faith when they died, verse 12 says, or verse 13. They did not receive the things promised They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting they were foreigners and strangers on earth. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly country, a heavenly one. How much of our anxiety and stress, and I'm speaking to me as much as I'm speaking to anyone in this room, is based on the attachments to this earth that scripture says will not one day go away. When was the last time you thought about, I'm a foreigner. I'm a stranger on this earth. This is not my home. That's why you can sit, sit next to the bed Many of you have done this with your parents or or other people that you've known in your life. And with grace and with confidence, they're looking forward. It's almost like they can see, see something. Now, I know there's been stories, you know, the people have died and they've gone to heaven and they've come back, they've seen the light. I, I don't know about all that. I've never had that experience But I'll tell you right now, I believe in a heaven even though I haven't seen it. I have no clue what it looks like. No more tears, no more mourning, 
food, that's big. Singing, some of you better get started. Or you're not going to be happy in heaven. Rivers. I don't know what it looks like. But I think I need to be looking forward to it way more than I do. Strangers. Living by faith is not becoming too attached. If you look at what you spend most of your time and your worries, and it probably is things that are attached here. Again, we know, don't, don't hear what I'm not saying. You know there's things we've got to take care of, and we've got to go to work and, or whatever, and we've got to have, I, I, I'm not saying that, but I have a feeling most of our anxieties and worries are about the things that will go away someday. Living by faith is most often without details. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as an inheritance, obeyed and went even though he did not know where he was going. You've heard me say often here, so many of the biggest decisions in your life will be made without details. Some of you got married one day, upon a, once upon a time, without details. <laughs> you had some things. You had some things made out. You had some things worked out in your head. You had some of that, but you didn't have near all of it. By faith, you got married. <laughs> By faith, you become a parent. By faith. You don't know all of it. I mean, we live by faith in so many different ways. When was the last time you introduced yourself to your pilot on your, on, on your, on your last flight? And checked out, they vetted them and checked out the mechanics who were looking at it by faith. When was the last time you got in your car and drove to church? I'm glad you did today, but how many of you vetted all the people you drove by on the way over here today? By faith. By faith. We do so many things by faith. I hit my button on my TV and it comes on. I have no clue how it works. None whatsoever. But by faith, I have a feeling if I hit that button, that TV is going to come on. By faith. So many things I don't understand. So many things I don't, by faith. And so many things come without details, especially when we're following after God. We don't have all the details. And I love what, I love this, the way the writer puts it here. Down in verse 12, and so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and countless as the sand on the seashore. I love Romans 4, 19 explains that passage of scripture, right? It says, it says, and Abraham's faith did not weaken even though at about 100 years of age, he figured his body was as good as dead. I love this. And so was Sarah's womb. He did not let those limitations. He kept going. He went where he didn't know where he was headed. But he kept going. The age did not stop him. Stop him. Barren, not able to bear children, did not stop Sarah. She, she knew that the one who made the promise, she trusted, she didn't understand the promise as much, but she understood the one who gave the promise. Often, so often, in life, whether you're a child and you've got parents or you're married to someone who's kind of maybe even a dreamer sometimes or whatever, you trust them. You don't always trust what they projected or what they proposed because you don't understand it maybe, but you do trust them. And so you begin to take steps. You don't have to have all the details. Matter of fact, you most often won't have most of the details. Because a matter of fact, I believe so often we work it out in our human mind, we talk ourselves out of doing what God's asking us to do. Because somehow or another, we believe we're supposed to know all the details. What if I trusted God? What if I did? What if I laid it down today? I'm going to trust God with all my influence. What would that look like? 
I mean, I trust God every week to get up here. Man, I, I was telling Dan, I was here yesterday evening. It, this thing was a mess. It was still a mess when I left at 5.30. It's just six pages worth of mess. But I went home last night trusting that somehow between now and tomorrow morning, this is going to come together to make some kind of sense for some kind of people. Somewhere. May not be here, but somewhere. By faith, I began to preach in 1987. Again, only being a Christian nine months, I began to preach by faith because I believed God had pulled me to do that without any details. By faith, we came over here in 2012. Yes, I could see the building. Yes, there were some things, but there were so many unknowns. You are the same place I am. You can go back and start going, I didn't know that, but I knew God was showing me. I trusted him there. Some of you right now, it's your fears. Will you let God, will you trust him with what you're most fearful about? Brandon brought it up in, a while ago in, 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 in the announcements about giving and tithing. For some people, that is one of their biggest steps is to trust God first in their finances. It just wasn't for me. It, it just never, I don't know why, but it, maybe it was a smaller number back then. I don't know. <laughs> it was a smaller number, but maybe that's why. I, I don't know. But I wasn't smart enough to argue with God. And I, what he had done for me, I just have never gotten over. So why would I not at least trust him with the first? Sometimes our faith is shaken, though, isn't it? So shaken. Whether it's a tragedy that you didn't see coming or something maybe you were a part of or someone questioned you. There's a lot of things of how you just kind of got, wow, how, where did that come from? How did that happen? What, here's what God, I'm trying to honor you in all things. How does this happen? And it comes for different reasons, and we don't know all the reasons. I mean, we've had, sure, we've been giving all of our life. We've given God. We believe we've walked by faith, but yes, it doesn't keep us from having cancer and, and, and you know, or things like that. It doesn't mean there's not heartache and loss of life and tragedy. It just doesn't mean that. So if you're hearing me today going, wait, just be faith in God. Everything's going to be like, oh, perfect now. Well, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying your, shape, your, your faith will be shaken. That's the reason I shared with you a few weeks ago when we talk about the stages of faith. If you're not careful, if you're in that second stage of alienation and something tragic or something not what you thought comes and shakes your faith when God really wants it to be in the transformative stage, you're in the alienation stage. If you're not so careful, you'll be backwards. I'd been a Christian about a, uh, less than two years and we got audited by the IRS. It's just not fun, just to be honest with you. And Jan, and, and thing was, Jan was pregnant with Allie, it's 1988, and Jan's pregnant with Allie, and we're building a new house, and I'm in the middle of working 12-hour shifts, five, six days a week, and working. On, and as soon as I get off, I go work on that house. It was just this crazy time. We're living with her parents because we, had, because we were trying to live with her to save money, live with him to try to save money, and, and so we can get into our house, and all this kind of stuff, we get audited right in the middle of it. Jan, now at this point, seven, eight months pregnant, I think she's driving back from her tax preparer or for a CPA and she says she's just driving when she's telling me this after she got home. She's driving and realized we're going to have to pay money in and all this kind of stuff with penalties and all this kind of stuff. And it's just kind of, you know, we, we, weren't, we weren't in a good place. And she said the Lord was, she said she was just praying, crying out to the Lord, literally crying, crying out to the Lord, going, Lord, why? Why now? Why us? And she said this just very soft, implying voice said, because you owe it. There's a lot of reasons we get in places, right? And we did owe it. And they were right. We never stopped giving. 
We just continue to trust. I know what it's like to have a house in 2011 that was worth $510,000. Sounds like a lot. I get it. That's now worth $280,000. But we never stop giving. We never stop trusting. Because, yeah, I know what it's like in that song. You've led me through the fire. And in the darkest nights, you're closer than a brother. You do too. Keep walking. Keep moving. And the last one is this. Living by faith, it should be progressive. And I'm not talking politically. Moses and the Israelites came to the Red Sea. God split the water in front of them and they walked across. When he came to Joshua in the Jordan, they had to put their feet in the water first or it wasn't moving. The reason why we've used this ladder for so many years. Faith is progressive. I read John chapter 1, and Jesus saying to Peter, follow me. And I read John chapter 21, and Jesus says to Peter, follow me. It's not the same follow me. It's a different follow me. It's the same words. It is the same words, and it's the same people, but it's a whole different meaning in 21 verses 1. Go read it. Where he was calling Peter, you talking about darkest nights, Peter was going to have them. Our journey to Arizona back in 1997, after a year of praying and being asked to leave Texarkana, where our family was, where, where I, get, I, I really came to know the Church of the Nazarene, but especially in youth ministry full-time, was the NY president for the Dallas district. But a new Lord was releasing us from Texarkana, and that was stirring and happening. And I remember sitting at General Assembly in 1997 in San Antonio, Texas, in a hotel room being interviewed by the World Missions Board about Jan and I and the four, our four kids. At that time, Colton was two, so you can kind of, I don't know if your picture's up. We got that picture. I don't know if we do or not. That's our crew there. And uh, that's where we were. Colton's really happy about taking that picture, just so you know. Uh, but that was us. And leave it up there for a minute. And the reason why I'm sharing this story is, is that I'm praying and I'm, we've been asked to be interviewed. We were contacted by the denomination. At this point, I'd been a pastor for four, five years, had no college education, really no Nazarene pedigree, but they had asked me and our family to go to, to Africa for two years and to live in Johannesburg in a compound. The girl, Jane and the girls, Jane and the kids would live there. And then I would travel all over by plane, travel all over Africa where we could and teach and lead and, and mentor youth pastors. Exciting, all the things that go with that. A month later, I get a phone call from a guy named Bob Bolton who just passed away the last few weeks from Crossroads Nazarene Church and we begin to take steps and before you know it, we end up here in Arizona. And I remember driving to Arizona and and uh, we drove through the night to get here because they were only going to pay for mine and Jan's flight to come out here. And I said, I want my kids here. I want all, I want all six of us on the ground praying about this. And we get here, and I drove all through the night, and we were staying at a, 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 
can't think of the name of it now, but some suites down where Chandler Mall is now, but there wasn't no mall there. There was dirt. There was a lot of dirt in 1997. Price Road was just what it was, Chandler Boulevard. And I dropped them off it's about noon, and I go get us something to eat. And some of you have heard this story before, but I, I'm driving along. I'm driving down to Taco Bell or what account, KFC, I can't remember, but I think they may have been together back then. But anyway, I, and I'm coming back, and I'm talking about, we're talking about from Kyrene, those who know the road, Kyrene to Price Road, not very far. And I'm looking out across that place going, this is the ugliest place I've ever seen in my life. What are we doing here? What in the world are we doing here? Just go to the hotel, put them back in the van, let's go home. And in that moment, I'm listening to Caleb. I usually, Jan, I usually find Caleb. Back then, we'd find Caleb every big city we would go to. And it's a national show, just so you know, our national radio. And it's Pastor Appreciation Month, it's October. Make that a note on your calendar, just so you uh, And over the radio comes a guy named Ken who just says, I just want to tell my pastor, Pastor Mark Fuller, the Crossroads Nazarene Church in Chandler, Arizona, how much I love him and how much we appreciate him. In that moment that I'm thinking about going and loading up that van, the Lord knew where I was. He knew what I needed. And would I make a decision to move my family to Arizona based on that one thing? Of course not. Of course not. But it is sometimes just so cool that God goes, no, I know where you are. I know where you are. And you, and you sense that and you believe it. And you, by faith, I believe he was involved in that. But the reason I share that with you today is not near as much about what happened there. Because I believe this, right? I hope and pray the longer you know me, the more faith you would have in me as your leader, not less. Does that make sense? I mean, I would think that. I would hope that. Because if it's less, I don't know why you're still here. I mean, honestly, I, mean, I don't mean that. It, but hopefully that's grown. But what if you apply that to your walk with God? So it would mean the further I've been walking with him, it should mean that in the faith I had in 1997 should be so exponentially beyond in 2023. And it should be more narrow in focus, right? Because I've continued to walk and walk by faith. I've continued I've continued. And just asking, Lord, where are you taking me? Where are you taking Jan and I? What are you doing with us? But if we're not careful, I'm going to ask the band to come on up. But if we're not careful, when you get to my age, you have scarcity. I should be dreaming even bigger because I've been walking with the Lord 26 more years. Does that make sense? Not, okay, how can I hang on to this? Or I, will I have enough there? You know I've preached here on the spirit of Caleb. Series or part of a series I did a few years ago. But Caleb, who when he got to go into the promised land, he was 85 years old, 40 years later, he's going, give me my mountain. He said, I have the same energy and the same faith, everything that I had back then when you put me with those knuckleheads. To wait 40 years, like we said before, sometimes you're in the, what was the pruning stage because of somebody else. You're not there because of you. You're there because you're hanging out with the wrong people who are getting pruned with you. Right? Sometimes that's true. The reason why you're there is because you're with people who are getting, having to go through it too. You had to wait for them all to die off. I hope that's not the case for you. That's what happened there. But what I love about that story of Caleb is he didn't say, 
give me the easiest. He said, give me the place where the giants lived that kept us out of there in the first place. That's where I want to go. I don't know what your age is today. Here's an advantage, and I heard this on a show the other night, and I thought this is a pretty cool way to think. Sometimes you look around and you're turning, about to turn 64 I am, in the next few months, and go, wow, how did I get here? All the wisdom I have, I wish I was 25. Anybody ever thought that? But I heard this the other night, and I thought, you know, the one thing I have over a person who's age 25 is I got to live to be 64, and they're not guaranteed of that. And just be thankful that I got to see both. I got to be younger and older and just grateful. As Jan and I drove across, because Jan and I have She's had to, through circumstances, help with some folks who are aging, significantly aging and in bad health. And we were talking about it the other day and go, man, our next 25 years, if the Lord gives it to us, won't look like the last 25 health-wise. We don't know that for sure. But she said it may be our most influential, though. And she and I drove across Utah coming back from Allie and Ben and Allie's wedding with the goodness of God cranked in my truck singing it as loud as we could sing it that all my life he has been faithful even I was not and I'm sure not perfect at it now but he has been would you stand with me as we close out today and sing we all have faith so if you came here today thinking "Ah, I'm going to hang out with those people of faith you are a person of faith Don't become too attached to this world. Of course, we've got things to do and things, but don't become too attached. Don't be afraid to move because you don't have all the details because most of the time, they won't be there. But your faith should be progressive. But all my life, I hope you can sing it with all your heart. He has been faithful. Lord, help us right now as we close out this time together. That we don't just have a faith that's just believing the right things. We have a faith that believes you saved us when we couldn't save ourselves from ourselves, from our past, for where we're going in the future, that we're strangers or foreigners here you give us power for the present. That we don't have a faith that just stops us from doing something, but we have a faith that causes us to become something we never could have been before. But Lord, let us take inventory. That we begin to operate out of scarcity or coasting. Or Lord, maybe, just maybe, because the age we are, and Lord, I know there's physical things and there's a lot of things that go with it. But maybe you're just stretching our faith to a whole new level now. But we love you. Help us now as we sing, as we close. We pray this in your name, Jesus.